Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Elin's home, where she grew up, always seemed like a place forgotten by time. Built decades ago, it sighed heavily under the perpetually gray sky of the town, like an old person worn out from endless years of worries. The aged walls of the house held the sorrows and hopes of many people who lived under its roof. Mold had settled in the corners of the house, a reminder of the unseen but constant enemy, dampness, which made the air heavy and moist. Elin was the second child in a large and noisy family. She was only a year and a half younger than her elder sister Sarah, who was born premature and often fell ill. Sarah's fragile health was a constant source of concern for their mother, Monica, who, lacking the means for her treatment, often sighed while looking at her coughing daughter. The drafts and dampness, constant companions in their lives, only exacerbated the condition of little Sarah. One day, their aunt, their mother's sister, who rarely appeared in their lives but left noticeable changes after each visit, came to visit them. Seeing Sarah's terrible condition and the living conditions of the family, the aunt took matters into her own hands. She found an experienced doctor for her niece and paid for all the necessary medicines and treatments. However, it soon became clear that Sarah's return to the old house, where mold and dampness awaited her, would render the doctor's efforts and the aunt's endeavors futile. The child was allergic to dampness, and there was no chance of recovery for her here. The aunt, who had no children of her own but had yearned for them with all her heart, could not leave her niece in such a situation. With tears in her eyes and a heart full of determination, she took Sarah away with her, arranging guardianship and eventually adopting her. How she negotiated this with Monica, the mother of the girls, remained an unsolved mystery, but shortly after her departure, money appeared in the house. For the first time in many years, Elin, her brothers, and sisters tasted waffles and chocolate, savoring each bite like a small celebration. However, happiness was short-lived. Their father, Harry, a harsh and gloomy man, soon lost all the money, and the family found themselves in poverty once again. In addition to Sarah and Elin, there were five other children in the family. The youngest child was born with a severe pathology and lived only three months. Three brothers and sisters remained. Elin's mother, Monica, sick and worn out by constant pregnancies, looked much older than her years. She was married off when she was just over 16 years old. By the age of 17, she already had Sarah on her hands. A woman who had never known love and tenderness, she was quiet and subdued, never contradicting her husband. She remained silent even when he tried to discipline the children, who were afraid of him, and never dared to stand up for the little ones. Harry, who worked as a long-distance truck driver, was rarely at home, and in his absence, Monica could breathe freely. Harry did not love his family, constantly crying children, an unkempt wife, and the constant dirt and stench from wet diapers irritated him. The husband quietly beat his wife, and Monica silently endured all the insults and humiliations. Harry returned from another trip on his truck, lived at home for a couple of weeks, showering everyone around with insults and threats, and then left again. The children quietly crept out of their hiding places like kittens hiding from a mean chained dog, and peace and tranquility returned to the house. However, the money left by the father quickly ran out. If, after Harry's departure, Monica did not become pregnant, she sought additional work to somehow feed the children. But if she began to suffer from severe morning sickness a couple of weeks later, signaling the beginning of another pregnancy, Monica knew she would have to economize on everything, with no possibility of additional work. Each subsequent pregnancy was increasingly difficult, miscarriages occurred more and more often, and Monica was relieved by this, realizing that she would not be able to raise another child. Relatives tried to inquire from Monica why she did not use contraception, but received a modest answer, Harry did not like it, and he even forbade her to think about abortion. In the house where every rustle reminded of grievances and fears, Elin found solace in her brothers and sisters. The little children, barely knowing life beyond their cracked walls, remained islands of pure joy and innocence against all odds. Elin, will you play with me? softly asked the youngest sister, Maggie pulling an worn-out stuffed bear towards herself. Of course, Maggie, smiled Elin, admitting that such moments were her salvation. Playing, they could forget about the fears their father brought home every time. 
and as she drifted off to sleep on the old bed with the sagging mattress, holding Maggie close, Ellen dreamed of the day she could leave this house, leaving her father and mother to deal with their problems alone. She felt sorry for her younger brothers and Maggie, but Ellen made herself a firm promise, if she could break free from the clutches of poverty, she would definitely take care of her brothers and sisters. One day, when their father was home, Ellen, who was twelve by then, and nine-year-old Maggie returned from school earlier than usual. The younger brothers were nowhere in sight, but noises and commotion could be heard from the kitchen. Ellen strained to make out their mother's whispers. Harry, not now, and not so loud, the children are here. She began, but he cut her off harshly. You should be grateful I came back at all, Monica. His words echoed off the damp walls, driving the children deeper under their blankets. Ellen entered the room, hugged the boys and Maggie. Don't be scared, Dad will talk to Mom and leave again. Everything will be okay. The boys emerged from under the covers and climbed onto Ellen's lap, holding her tightly. Ellen kissed her brothers and reaffirmed her decision, it was right to escape this house as soon as possible. Every time their father left, the house seemed to sigh with relief. Ellen's mother, worn out and tired, became a little freer, though she continued to stay silent, holding on to all her hurt and humiliation. Mom, don't cry, Ellen would say softly when she found Monica alone, quietly sobbing in a corner. I'm trying to hang on, dear. For you, for all my children, Monica would reply, hugging her daughter as if it could save them from this merciless world. Days passed monotonously, each one blending into the next, until one day Ellen overheard a conversation between her father and mother during one of his rare visits home. Monica, I can't give up this job. Who will feed the family? His words were filled with threat. Harry, I. I'll find a way. Maybe I can find a job, Monica struggled to sound stronger than she actually felt. A job? And who will take care of the kids, huh? You're supposed to be home, that's your duty. Harry was relentless. Ellen listened, pressed against the wall. Her heart beat in sync with each word. She knew that if anything could change in their lives, it would only be through pain and suffering. The next morning, when her father left, she sat in the kitchen with her mother, gently holding her hand. Mom, we have to change something. We can't go on like this, Ellen said firmly, feeling her own desperation fueling a desire to act. Yes, dear. But what can we do? And you know, I'm pregnant again, tears welled up in Monica's eyes. I feel so awful. Monica raised lifeless eyes to Ellen, devoid of hope. Take care of the younger ones, I'm counting on you. With those words, Monica quietly left the kitchen and went to her room. Ellen sighed heavily and clattered the pots to start dinner for her younger siblings. Days passed, one after another, in a monotonous sequence of sun and moon. Ellen almost stopped going to school, as more and more of her time was spent caring for her younger brothers and sister. Ellen, you must go to school today, Monica insisted every morning, trying to encourage her. Mom, I can't. Michael is still too young, and you, you're too weak to manage alone, Ellen looked at her mother with worry and care. Monica tried to smile, but her face remained pale and exhausted. I'll ask Mrs. Jackson, our neighbor, to come by. She'll help. You need school, daughter. You shouldn't lose your future because of me. Mom, my future is here, with you, Ellen hugged Monica tightly, feeling how much weight her mother had lost recently. And Harry disappeared. They usually expected him home after three months. But three months passed, then half a year, and there was no news of him, nor did he appear himself. Monica, now seven months pregnant, increasingly began to fear the worst, but she lacked the strength to accept it. She knew she had to take care of the children, but her own health deteriorated with each passing day. One evening, when all the younger children were already asleep, Monica looked at Ellen and said firmly, Tomorrow morning, I'm going to the police. We need to find out what happened to Harry. Ellen nodded in agreement. I'll come with you, Mom. No, you'll stay home. You need to get the older ones to school and watch over Michael. I'll manage on my own. I'm feeling better now. Monica got up and went to bed. Good night, dear. Good night, Mom. 
The next morning, Ellen got up, prepared breakfast, fed the younger ones, and sent them off to school. She peeked into her mother's room to get Michael, who was peacefully sleeping in his crib next to Monica's bed. Certain that Monica had already gone to the police, Ellen was very surprised to see her mother still in bed. Ellen quietly approached her and called out. Mom, Mom, it's time to get up, she whispered, but Monica didn't respond. Suddenly, Ellen felt something was wrong. Monica lay on the bed, unmoving. Ellen gently shook her mother's shoulder, and Monica turned to face her. A chilling cold ran down Ellen's spine when she saw Monica's lifeless eyes. Underneath her, the mattress was horribly stained with a reddish-brown puddle. Mom. Ellen cried out, but it was too late. Apparently, the tragedy had occurred much earlier, the baby had died long ago, and Monica hadn't had the strength to understand it or call for help. Ellen stood frozen, trying to gather her thoughts. She knew she had to act, but shock paralyzed her. The house fell into a dead silence, broken only by the soft sobbing of the youngest brother. Michael sobbed louder and louder until he finally burst into heartbreaking cries. His cries seemed to awaken Ellen. Choking back tears streaming down her cheeks, she picked up the phone to call for an ambulance. Please, come quickly, my mom. I think she's dead, she said, her voice trembling. Then she took Michael out of the crib and ran to Mrs. Jackson, the neighbor, afraid to look back at the house where death had entered, silently thanking fate that the younger children hadn't witnessed any of this. Monica's funeral was modest and quiet, without unnecessary words or flowers. The farewell was brief, like the life that seemed an endless string of missed opportunities and unfulfilled hopes. The next day, child services arrived at the house. A well-dressed woman placed the boys and Maggie in the car. I want to go with you, Maggie whispered, not letting go of Ellen's hand. But the child services worker gently but firmly removed Maggie's hand and took Ellen aside. Returning to the car, she gently stroked Maggie's head and, seemingly oblivious to the tears streaming from the girl's eyes, closed the car door. Maybe soon you'll be together again, but for now, you'll have to be patient. The youngest child, Michael, was taken by Mrs. Jackson, who was friends with Monica. She arranged to become his legal guardian, promising him the care and love he had been lacking in his short life. The child services worker approached Ellen, who watched everything as if from a movie theater seat. The girl couldn't believe that all of this was not a dream but an inescapable reality. Ellen, you have to come with me, the child services worker said gently. We'll find you a new home. I don't want to go to a shelter, Ellen said desperately, staring out at the darkening streets through the window. It's temporary, dear. Just until we find you a suitable family, the woman persuaded her, but Ellen felt fear gripping her heart. Tomorrow morning, I'll send a car for you. In the meantime, you can pack your things, the child services worker said with forced tenderness. Or would you like to leave now? Ellen shook her head negatively. Tomorrow. I'll wait for you tomorrow morning. When the house quieted down after the services left, Ellen surveyed the empty rooms and quietly cried. But realizing tears wouldn't change anything, she opened the closet and pulled out a small, worn-out travel bag and an old photo album. She flipped through the album's pages, reminiscing about moments from her past, and pulled out two photos, one of her mother and another of the entire family with her mother, all her siblings, but without her father. Then she went out into the yard, started a fire, and threw the album, all her notebooks and drawings, everything that reminded her of the past, into it. Returning to the house, Ellen stuffed the two remaining photos, a pair of jeans, an old sweater, a dried piece of bread, and a few coins she found in her brother's piggy bank into the bag. Her heart raced as she cautiously opened the door and stepped out into the cool night. The city greeted Ellen indifferently, it hadn't been expecting her. Without documents, no one would hire her, and soon she found herself among the local homeless, sleeping in cardboard boxes near the station and rummaging through trash bins. Why are you here, girl? An old homeless man asked her one day as she sat near the subway entrance. I've lost everything, Ellen barely whispered, tears streaming down her cheeks. In this city, there's always a place for people like you. The main thing is not to lose hope, the old man wisely said handing her half of his dry piece of bread. 
Those words gave Ellen some encouragement, but the days grew colder, and she had to beg more often and sneak food from open cafes to survive. One day, sitting on the steps of a massage salon, Ellen noticed an elegant woman stepping out of a limousine. The woman stopped, gazing at Ellen's dirty but beautiful face. What's your name? she asked, approaching closer. Ellen, the girl whispered, looking up at the stranger. I'm Mrs. Brown. And I think I have a job for you. Come with me, Mrs. Brown said gently, extending her hand to Ellen. That day, Ellen's life changed drastically. Mrs. Brown brought her to her salon, where Ellen was carefully cleaned, dressed, and trained in the basics of massage therapy. Ellen's chestnut hair was neatly styled, and her face was lightly made up. You're very beautiful, Ellen. And you have a future, Mrs. Brown said confidently, watching as Ellen looked at her reflection in the mirror. Thank you, Mrs., Ellen replied quietly, realizing that fate had finally smiled upon her and turned toward a happier future. Working at the massage salon, Ellen caught the eye of a wealthy gentleman, Brian, who immediately noticed the new quiet girl. He was captivated by her fair skin, brown eyes, and chestnut hair that cascaded lightly over her slender shoulders. But most striking was her well-toned figure. After discussing with Mrs. Brown, Brian took Ellen out of the salon and made her his mistress. He bought Ellen a small apartment on the outskirts of the city, enrolled her in modeling courses, and financed her modest purchases. For five years, Ellen lived this way. Thanks to her lover Brian, she transformed from an awkward girl into a beautiful lady. Ellen visited beauty salons, went to the gym. She began to resemble a bud of an expensive flower, about to bloom and enchant everyone with her unearthly beauty. Brian helped Ellen obtain her high school diploma through distance learning, taught her to drive, and how to behave correctly in high society. Brian also assisted Ellen in restoring her documents. Now she had not only a passport but also a driver's license. The wealthy lover enjoys the company of an exquisite beauty. He has taken Ellen on several cruises, far from their hometown, where they could be caught by his friends or, worse, his wife. Ellen initially rejoiced at everything that was happening, feeling like she had hit the jackpot. But gradually, she realized that her life resembled that of a pampered pet with a golden collar and leather leash. Yes, Ellen no longer went hungry, expensive paintings adorned the walls of her apartment instead of cobwebs and mold, but every step she took was controlled by Brian. He demanded an account for every cent spent and for every minute spent outside the house. Ellen understood that this wealthy life wasn't what she had imagined. One morning, waking up with a dreadful thought, what if she suddenly got tired of Brian, or he fell out of love with her? What then? Would she have to beg on the streets again, she grew fearful? She began to think about how she could change things. First, Ellen decided to find a friend who could be her assistant and support, realizing how difficult it would be to break free on her own. But where would she find such a friend? Fate itself provided her with an idea. The gym where Ellen had been going for several years closed for renovations, and she persuaded Brian to allow her to attend another gym. It was a bit further from home, but the path led through a beautiful park where Ellen hoped to meet a good person. Luck awaited her at the gym. The newcomers immediately noticed Ellen. However, politely smiling at everyone, she refrained from making close acquaintances. She observed people, trying to understand who among them could help her. She had already attended three workouts without choosing anyone when Jack, a lively, young realtor with an infectious smile and a sparkle in his eyes, approached her as she was leaving the gym. Are you new here? Jack asked, attentively examining Ellen. Do you need help with the equipment? Yes, thank you, I wouldn't mind, Ellen smiled, feeling a spark of sympathy ignite in her heart. Great, Jack winked at her, I'll be your personal guide at the gym tomorrow. He waved his hand and disappeared into the locker room. The next day, Jack awaited Ellen at the gym entrance. He quickly told her about all the equipment, and then unexpectedly suggested, let's take a walk after the workout. I suggest we have coffee together. Ellen hesitated for a moment but agreed. After the workout, they sat in a cafe, each with a cup of coffee, and strolled through the town's streets. Jack offered to walk Ellen all the way to her apartment but she declined, realizing that Brian might notice them. Instead, she said, Goodbye. 
to Jack near a neighboring house and slipped into the entranceway. Waiting until Jack had left, she sneaked out and went home. All evening and the next day, Ellen thought about Jack, remembering his voice and smile, and pondered how easy and peaceful she felt with him. Now Ellen and Jack walked together after each workout. With each meeting, they grew closer and closer. Jack was open, attentive, and seemed like the person who could accept her as she was. Ellen listened to her heart, which trembled with happiness every time Jack appeared at the gym entrance. He smiled at her with his infectious smile, and she knew they would spend the evening together again tonight. This continued for several months until one evening, after a workout, Jack invited Ellen to his home. At first, she hesitated, but after much persuasion, she agreed. At Jack's home, he showed Ellen around the rooms and then, sitting her down on the couch in the living room, he sat beside her. I have a proposal for you, Jack gently took Ellen's hand in his own. As you see, I live alone. I have a modest but nice apartment that lacks feminine warmth. Move in with me. Let's live together, maybe we can make something work. Jack looked at Ellen hopefully. She lowered her gaze, feeling her cheeks flush, her heart pounding in her temples. This is a serious step, Jack, Ellen sighed heavily. She didn't want to start a new life with deceit. I have something to tell you. Of course, tell me. I'm always ready to listen to you, Jack smiled, kissing her hand. In Ellen's eyes, a shadow of doubt flickered, but she resolved to be honest with the person she loved and had chosen to share her life with. Jack, I need to tell you something about my past. She began, and honestly recounted her entire story, about poverty, her mother's death, the time spent on the streets, and the struggle for survival. Ellen explained that she now lived with Brian, as his mistress. She admitted that this life had become tiresome, and she wanted to change it. Jack listened silently, his gaze turning colder and an expression of deep disappointment settling on his face. Slowly releasing Ellen's hands, he looked down. Ellen, I… I don't know. My parents and friends would never understand such a choice. They would never accept me if I stayed with a girl from such a background, Jack confessed after a long pause. An uneasy silence filled the room, interrupted only by the noise of the street outside the window. We can never be together, I'm sorry, Jack whispered softly, as if each word took an immense effort. Ellen felt her heart turn icy cold. She stood up quickly, barely holding back tears right there. I understand, Jack. Just forget about this conversation, she whispered, and swiftly left, leaving Jack bewildered and regretful. Alone on the street, Ellen promised herself that she would never again trust anyone enough to reveal her past. My past life is my secret. No one should ever know about it, Ellen decided that same evening, sitting in her apartment, barely calming her sobs. She avoided the gym and any places where she might run into Jack. Ellen had no idea she would soon forget Jack, as a new crisis was already looming on her doorstep. One morning, pouring herself coffee, Ellen suddenly felt nauseous. The sensation repeated at lunch and in the evening. A foreboding feeling pushed Ellen to buy a pregnancy test, confirming her fears. Struggling to contain her emotions, Ellen called Brian, whom she hadn't seen in a week. I told you to only call in emergencies, Brian hissed instead of a greeting when Ellen finally reached him. Brian, I need to talk to you, it's urgent, she said into the phone. Fine, I'll be over in a couple of hours. We'll talk then, he replied, and hung up. Two hours later, Brian sat on Ellen's kitchen couch, sipping whiskey. I'm waiting for your explanation, you've interrupted important matters, he said. I'm pregnant, tears welled up in Ellen's eyes. His response was cold and sharp. These are your problems, Ellen. Remember our agreement. I need a beautiful and smart assistant to accompany me to various business meetings. I already have a family, a wife, and kids. I don't need another child, especially one born out of wedlock. But Brian, this is my first child, and I can't just. Brian was unyielding, staring at Ellen with irritation. You should have thought about that earlier. I won't support you with a child. I'll pay for the clinic to take care of it. That's it, I've said everything. I need to go. Brian got up, 
counted out some money, tossed it onto the table. This is for your recovery. I'll pay for the clinic and call you on the phone, Brian approached Ellen and hugged her. My girl, don't cry, these are just trifles. I need you young and beautiful. He kissed Ellen on her tear-streaked cheek, and soon the door closed behind him. Ellen sat there, stunned and alone. She realized how much her life depended on Brian and his desires. The next morning, she went to the clinic Brian had paid for, to make decisions about her future actions. It was cold outside, and the wind tousled her hair, as if trying to distract her from her sorrowful thoughts. Ellen walked ahead, unaware that new trials awaited her. After completing all the necessary tests, Ellen was invited into the doctor's office. An elderly physician was jotting something down in a journal when Ellen quietly crossed the threshold of his office. The doctor silently pointed to a chair against the wall and raised his eyes to the young woman, filled with weariness and concern. Miss Ellen, you have a serious hereditary condition and a rare blood group. If you decide to terminate the pregnancy now, you may not be able to have children in the future, he said. Ellen sat there with her head bowed. The doctor's words felt like a sharp knife, slicing her soul into tiny pieces. I have nowhere to go with a baby in my arms. I have no home or money. I fear he won't survive on the cold streets. Ellen trailed off, lowering her head further into her shoulders. The doctor shook his head. Is this your final decision, Miss Ellen? Ellen nodded affirmatively, avoiding the doctor's gaze to shield him from the desperation and pain that had settled in her eyes. Very well, go prepare for the procedure. I can only promise you that I will do everything in my power. But I am not God. Ellen remembered very little about the surgery itself and the recovery afterward. It was as if her consciousness had disconnected her from reality to help her survive. When Ellen began to come to herself, it seemed as if it hadn't happened to her. Brian, realizing he could lose his dear favorite toy, whisked Ellen away to an expensive resort where she slowly began to return to life. Her body returned to its former shape, but her soul seemed to have hardened forever. A year later, Ellen realized that being Brian's mistress was not at all what she had envisioned for her life. Brian paid her less attention, and Ellen began to suspect that she had worn out her welcome. If that were true, Brian could kick her out at any moment, plunging her life back into despair. I'll be gone for a while, Brian once said, slipping out of Ellen's embrace. But I won't be able to call you. I'll miss you terribly. Ellen immediately detected the insincerity in Brian's voice but said nothing about it. After seeing him off, Ellen returned to the kitchen, brewed herself a strong coffee, and pondered. I need to escape from Brian because he'll never let me go just like that. But how can I do it? What can I come up with that won't just anger Brian and make him search for me but also make him feel guilty? Ellen contemplated the empty street outside, the few passers-by sheltering under umbrellas from the cold rain, and an ingenious plan matured in her mind. Ellen understood that she needed money. Brian was greedy and wouldn't simply give her money. But Brian had one weakness, when he indulged in whiskey, he started buying Ellen gifts that he couldn't remember in the morning. He would only lament his extravagance upon seeing the receipt but never take the gifts back. Ellen decided to exploit this vulnerability of her friend. When Brian once again got carried away with whiskey, Ellen slipped him a catalogue from an expensive jewelry salon. Look, darling, what a beautiful new collection. Brian picked up the magazine and flipped through it, examining the jewelry. I never understood the point of these useless trinkets. In my opinion, a woman's outward appearance is more adorned by her natural beauty than sparkling gems, he muttered. Ellen nodded but pressed on. Nevertheless, it's these gems that shine on a woman accompanying you that elevate your status and influence in society. Brian hiccuped and looked at Ellen with drunken eyes, overcoming a surge of generosity. So what do you like here? He waved the glossy magazine. Look at this lovely ring with a diamond. It would adorn my finger so nicely, Ellen pointed out. Without hesitation, Brian pulled out his phone and immediately bought the ring. You can pick it up at the jewelry store tomorrow, and then show it to me, Brian handed Ellen a copy of the receipt and the purchase code, then covered himself with a blanket and drifted into the realm of Morpheus.
After completing all the necessary tests, Ellen was invited into the doctor's office. An elderly physician was jotting something down in a journal when Ellen quietly crossed the threshold of his office. The doctor silently pointed to a chair against the wall and raised his eyes to the young woman, filled with weariness and concern. Miss Ellen, you have a serious hereditary condition and a rare blood group. If you decide to terminate the pregnancy now, you may not be able to have children in the future, he said. Ellen sat there with her head bowed. The doctor's words felt like a sharp knife, slicing her soul into tiny pieces. I have nowhere to go with a baby in my arms. I have no home or money. I fear he won't survive on the cold streets. Ellen trailed off, lowering her head further into her shoulders. The doctor shook his head. Is this your final decision, Miss Ellen? Ellen nodded affirmatively, avoiding the doctor's gaze to shield him from the desperation and pain that had settled in her eyes. Very well, go prepare for the procedure. I can only promise you that I will do everything in my power. But I am not God. Ellen remembered very little about the surgery itself and the recovery afterward. It was as if her consciousness had disconnected her from reality to help her survive. When Ellen began to come to herself, it seemed as if it hadn't happened to her. Brian, realizing he could lose his dear favorite toy, whisked Ellen away to an expensive resort where she slowly began to return to life. Her body returned to its former shape, but her soul seemed to have hardened forever. A year later, Ellen realized that being Brian's mistress was not at all what she had envisioned for her life. Brian paid her less attention, and Ellen began to suspect that she had worn out her welcome. If that were true, Brian could kick her out at any moment, plunging her life back into despair. I'll be gone for a while, Brian once said, slipping out of Ellen's embrace. But I won't be able to call you. I'll miss you terribly. Ellen immediately detected the insincerity in Brian's voice but said nothing about it. After seeing him off, Ellen returned to the kitchen, brewed herself a strong coffee, and pondered. I need to escape from Brian because he'll never let me go just like that. But how can I do it? What can I come up with that won't just anger Brian and make him search for me but also make him feel guilty? Ellen contemplated the empty street outside, the few passers-by sheltering under umbrellas from the cold rain, and an ingenious plan matured in her mind. Ellen understood that she needed money. Brian was greedy and wouldn't simply give her money. But Brian had one weakness, when he indulged in whiskey, he started buying Ellen gifts that he couldn't remember in the morning. He would only lament his extravagance upon seeing the receipt but never take the gifts back. Ellen decided to exploit this vulnerability of her friend. When Brian once again got carried away with whiskey, Ellen slipped him a catalogue from an expensive jewelry salon. Look, darling, what a beautiful new collection. Brian picked up the magazine and flipped through it, examining the jewelry. I never understood the point of these useless trinkets. In my opinion, a woman's outward appearance is more adorned by her natural beauty than sparkling gems, he muttered. Ellen nodded but pressed on. Nevertheless, it's these gems that shine on a woman accompanying you that elevate your status and influence in society. Brian hiccuped and looked at Ellen with drunken eyes, overcoming a surge of generosity. So what do you like here? He waved the glossy magazine. Look at this lovely ring with a diamond. It would adorn my finger so nicely, Ellen pointed out. Without hesitation, Brian pulled out his phone and immediately bought the ring. You can pick it up at the jewelry store tomorrow, and then show it to me, Brian handed Ellen a copy of the receipt and the purchase code, then covered himself with a blanket and drifted into the realm of Morpheus. Waking up in the morning, Brian, as usual, grabbed his phone and upon seeing the receipt from the previous night's purchase, scolded himself. We can return the ring, Ellen said gently and affectionately, though she pursed her lips, feigning offense. Brian looked at her. I don't take back gifts I've given to a beloved woman, unless she gives me reasons to. Wear it to envy everyone. Let them know I can spoil those I love. With these words, Brian got dressed, kissed Ellen, and left. She wasted no time, taking the receipt and heading to the jewelry store. At the jewelry store, Ellen tried on the ring and declined the purchase, explaining that it didn't suit her. She requested a cash refund for the ring and then visited a familiar jeweler to order a cheap replica of the gifted ring. 
Brian, not well versed in jewelry, saw the new ring on Ellen's finger the next time and compared it to the catalog photo, satisfied. He didn't suspect that the ring was a good imitation of the original. The next time Brian fell asleep, Ellen took his wallet from his pocket, removed the money, and tossed the wallet under the wheels of his car. Approaching his vehicle, Brian noticed two homeless men examining something near his car's wheel. As they noticed him, they fled. On closer inspection, Brian found his wallet. Opening it, he discovered that all the money was gone. It was futile to search for the homeless men, and resigned to the loss, Brian went home. Ellen continued to deceive Brian several times, each time coming up with a new scheme, her imagination knew no bounds. Once a significant sum had accumulated, Ellen decided to move on to the second part of her plan. Since she no longer frequented the gym, she started running around a lake in the park near her home every morning. There, she noticed a young man who walked his dog during her runs. One morning, as she jogged past him, Ellen accidentally stumbled and twisted her ankle. Ouch. It hurt so much. Ellen almost cried out, sitting down on the grass. What happened? How can I help you? A tall, handsome young man was immediately by her side. Yeah, I think I twisted my ankle a bit, Ellen replied, trying to hide the pain. Let me help you to the nearest pharmacy or call a taxi, the guy offered, reaching out his hand. Thank you, that would be wonderful, Ellen agreed with a smile, appreciating his kindness. Together, they slowly made their way out of the park exit, and the guy couldn't help but notice how the light breeze played with her chestnut hair and how the sun sparkled in her hazel eyes. I'm Logan, by the way. What's your name, he asked, supporting Ellen by the elbow. I'm Ellen, she replied. And thank you for your help, Logan. No problem, Ellen. These things happen sometimes, he smiled. By the way, if you have no plans tonight, maybe you'd let me buy you coffee? To make up for this awkward moment. Ellen hesitated for only a moment, his casual charm and genuine concern won her over. Sure, I think that would be nice, she agreed, getting lost in Logan's gray-blue eyes. That evening, as soon as Ellen entered the café Logan had chosen for their meeting, she spotted him sitting at a table in the back. Logan also noticed Ellen and quickly got up, approaching her with a gentle smile. How's your foot? Still hurting, he asked. Thanks, it still hurts a bit, but much better now, Ellen smiled back. I've already ordered. It'll be here soon. Let's go, Logan carefully took Ellen by the elbow and led her to the table where aromatic coffee awaited and several pastries were laid out. Seating Ellen, Logan sat across from her and, taking a sip of his hot coffee, asked. Do you always jog in this park in the mornings? Ellen smiled back, and between them, an engaging conversation ensued, at the end of which they were speaking freely and without formalities. After spending some time at the café, Logan suggested a stroll. They wandered through the park, discussing various topics from favorite books to travel adventures. Logan turned out to be not only attractive but also intelligent and interesting company. Ellen, you're very beautiful, and it's more than just your appearance, Logan unexpectedly confessed as he escorted her to her doorstep. Thank you, Logan. You make me blush, Ellen smiled, feeling her heart beat faster. From that evening on, they began to meet more frequently. Walks in the park, evenings at cafes, each time Logan fell more deeply in love with Ellen. She, in turn, found herself drawn to him, but what interested her most was his role as a protector and reliable accomplice in executing her plan. I thought I knew what it meant to fall in love, but with you, I truly feel it, Logan confessed one day as he and Ellen admired the sunset by the riverbank. Would you like to live together? He hugged Ellen tightly. Logan, I... I also feel that you're becoming more than just a friend to me, Ellen quietly replied, hesitant to open up too quickly. But I'm not ready to move in with you yet. Let's wait a bit longer. Logan just held Ellen closer. But one evening, after an argument with Brian, Ellen realized she couldn't delay any longer. She decided to take the risk and tell Logan about her plan, distorting the truth slightly. They sat in a cozy cafe, enjoying each other's company and the soft music playing in the background. Ellen had been silent and troubled all evening, and Logan couldn't bear it any longer. 
What's wrong, Ellen? You seem so distant today, he said. Ellen looked up at him, tears welling in her eyes. Logan, I need to talk to you about something important, she began, her voice trembling with nervousness. Logan took her hands in his and gently kissed them. Don't be afraid, Ellen. You know you can trust me. Ellen sighed, gathering her courage. I can't do this anymore, Logan. I'm tired. It's all about Brian, my ex. Our history together is complicated. And now I might need your help. Logan nodded, his whole demeanor showing readiness to go to the ends of the earth for Ellen. Brian is a very influential person, and he, he doesn't want to let me go, Ellen continued, brushing away tears from her beautiful lashes. I want to disappear from his life completely, to start fresh. But for that, I need to make him believe that I no longer exist and that he shouldn't look for me. Logan tensed, his brow furrowing. What do you mean? How do you plan to do this? Ellen breathed slowly. I want you to help me stage a robbery at my apartment. We'll pretend that not only my valuable items were stolen but that I was taken too. And then I will disappear. Logan looked at her, shocked. This is very risky, Ellen. Are you sure there's no other way? And the police. If an investigation starts, they'll trace it back to me, and then. Ellen suddenly smiled mysteriously. Don't worry, Logan. I've thought about this a thousand times. You're my only friend, and my apartment is in a secluded location, almost hidden from curious neighbors and without security cameras. Brian won't go to the police, it could damage his reputation. This is the only way to get him to leave me alone for good. I don't want my past life to harm someone I love, like you. Logan, hearing Ellen's last words, flinched and squeezed her hand tighter. All right, I'll help you. What exactly do we need to do? Ellen looked openly at Logan, sparks dancing in her eyes. We'll choose a day when I'll be alone at home. You'll enter like a thief and a rob the apartment. Take some valuable items that I'll prepare in advance and hide them with you. In my apartment, we'll create the appearance of a struggle and smear some blood on the floor. After that, I'll disappear, and if anyone asks, you can say that you saw some people force me into a black car and drive away. Logan nodded, though concern showed on his face. Ellen, this is dangerous. But if you're sure this is the only way, I'll do everything to protect you. Thank you, Logan. I knew I could rely on you, Ellen said gratefully. They spent the rest of the evening discussing the details of the plan. That night, Logan didn't accompany Ellen all the way home. They parted ways a couple of blocks from her building and agreed to only exchange brief morning greetings during their runs. Logan would wait for a signal, and Ellen would prepare for her escape. On the chosen day, everything went perfectly. Logan, wearing a mask and a pizza delivery uniform, burst into the apartment, quickly packed Ellen's belongings into a large bag that she had prepared, and froze by the door. Ellen lightly cut her finger and left smeared blood marks on the floor, creating the effect of dragging a heavy object. They then slammed the apartment door shut, exited the building, and got into a large dark car without license plates that Logan had rented from an old acquaintance, disappearing into the dark streets. Driving out of town, Logan transferred all the items and moved Ellen into his own car, parked at a supermarket, while he restored the license plates to the dark car and returned it to his friend. For an entire week, Ellen stayed at Logan's place, never venturing out. Logan maintained his usual daily routine, walking his dog in the park in the mornings, going to work, and returning home in the evenings. But now his eyes sparkled, and a happy smile stayed fixed on his face, Ellen awaited him at home. For Logan, it was a week of endless happiness, unrestrained love, and tenderness. For Ellen, it was just a brief respite before the main leap into the unknown. A week later, dressed in a voluminous dress that instantly disguised her slender figure, wearing a white wig and dark sunglasses that altered her appearance beyond recognition, Ellen went to her former home. She knew Brian was supposed to visit her today. Approaching her home, she sat on a bench in the playground in front of it and watched carefully. She saw Brian calmly park his car in its usual spot and enter the apartment. A few seconds later, he rushed out of the entrance, spun around in place, and went back upstairs. 
Half an hour later, he left, bewildered and angry, got into his car, and drove away, leaving a cloud of dust behind. As Ellen had anticipated, he didn't contact the police, realizing he would be the prime suspect in Ellen's disappearance and possible demise. The news that a respectable family man had kept a young lover for so many years wouldn't please his wife, but it would give the tabloids a reason to splash his name and tarnish his reputation. Ellen walked to the park and asked a quiet old man napping on a bench under the linden trees for his phone to make a call. She called Brian's wife, introducing herself as an advocate for deceived wives, and informed her that her husband had taken a mistress and bought her an apartment. She wouldn't disclose the exact location but could provide the address for a small, untraceable electronic transfer to her account. Ellen requested a modest yet acceptable sum and provided an electronic account that couldn't be traced. After waiting a few minutes, Ellen received a notification of funds deposited into her electronic account. She called Brian's wife again and gave her the address of her former apartment. Then she deleted all recent calls from the phone, returned it to its owner, who was still peacefully dozing on the bench, and left the park. A couple of days later, she learned from Logan that her former apartment was up for sale and Brian hadn't been seen there anymore. But over the seven years she had spent with him, Ellen had studied Brian well. She understood that he wouldn't just calm down, despite the scandals with his wife. Transforming herself daily with makeup, Ellen spent hours watching Brian from a cafe across his office. Her expectations were not in vain. One morning, she noticed a detective leaving the building where Brian worked. Ellen had once given this detective her business card herself. She knew the guy well, he had once visited a gym with Ellen. She also knew he was rather simple-minded, greedy, and lazy. She had intentionally slipped her business card to Brian, Ellen understood that after the scandal with his wife and the ensuing work problems, Brian wouldn't seek another detective but would use someone familiar. Ellen was already planning to intercept the detective on his way to his nearby car, but he unexpectedly headed towards the cafe. She mentally praised herself for her foresight and cunning. As soon as the detective settled at a table and ordered breakfast, Ellen joined him. Hello, Mr. Power, you probably don't remember me? The detective looked up in surprise at Ellen, who today had disguised herself so thoroughly with makeup that even her own mother wouldn't recognize her. I'm a friend of Ellen's, with whom you once went to the same gym. We met before one of the workouts. She really liked you, but she was shy to tell you about it. And then this Brian appeared in your lives. Ellen raised her hands dramatically. You know how he tormented my poor Ellen? How much she suffered because of him. And he's to blame for her death. Ellen pretended to hold back tears. She took out an old handkerchief and pressed it to her eyes. The detective involuntarily frowned. What are you trying to say? My friend. My beloved Ellen. She's dead. I was at the body identification yesterday. Look. The woman handed the detective several photographs confirming that Ellen had drowned in the stormy ocean. The detective examined the photos closely. I have information that Ellen was kidnapped. Playing the role of her friend, Ellen bitterly smirked. The robbers released the girl as soon as they left town. She came to me crying, afraid to return to Brian. He might not forgive her for opening the door to the robbers, thinking they were delivery service. I gave her some money so she could rest and recover her nerves. And look at what came out of it. Ellen reached out to take back the photos, but the detective stopped her. Suddenly, he realized he could demand money from Brian, supposedly for an investigation, and then calmly show him these photos. May I keep these photos? asked the detective, looking at Ellen, who was hiding her face behind the handkerchief. The woman sighed heavily. Of course, Mr. Power, if you tell Brian how badly he treated my poor friend, how scared she was of Brian. Ellen quietly stood up from the table and headed towards the cafe exit. Her shoulders trembled as if from sobbing, and her entire demeanor expressed sorrow and the bitterness of loss. The detective was satisfied, he anticipated a peaceful rest and a good reward for his work. Ellen, leaving the cafe at a decent distance, hailed a taxi and headed to Logan's house. Her soul rejoiced, her heart sang, she was sure Brian would mourn a little and soon forget about Ellen, shifting his attention to a new mistress. 
despite the scandals with his wife, alas, he was irredeemable. Now that Brian was no longer a threat to Ellen, she needed to find a way to get rid of Logan. The sweet, nice guy who was head over heels in love with Ellen had turned into a burden hindering Ellen's further plans. Logan was likable to her, but he had too little income and status, not at all what Ellen dreamed of. And she continued her game. The evening was quiet and cool, and only the sounds of dishes being set on the table for dinner disturbed the silence. Logan, tired after work, took a shower, humming a cheerful tune to himself. The aroma of roasted chicken filled the kitchen, spurring him on. Logan threw on his robe and strode into the kitchen, still humming. But as soon as he crossed the kitchen threshold, his carefree cheerfulness vanished into thin air. Ellen stood perplexed by the table, her demeanor causing concern. Logan approached and gently embraced Ellen, but she flinched suddenly at his touch and looked at him with a serious expression. Logan, we have a problem, she began, her voice trembling with tension. Logan stepped back from Ellen and sat down at the table, feeling his heart race in anticipation of bad news. What happened? Ellen paled and sat across from Logan, afraid to meet his eyes. I just received a video from Brian. He had installed cameras in the apartment. I had no idea, I swear, I didn't even suspect. And he recorded, everything, Ellen's voice broke on the last word. Logan felt a cold sweat run down his spine. Everything? You mean, he knows it was all staged? And he knows I helped you? Ellen nodded, her worry evident. The video clearly shows you entering the apartment and carrying out the items I first collected, and how we staged my kidnapping. The entire plan was exposed. Logan felt his head spin. What do we do now? If he goes to the police, or decides to settle this with me. I warned you it was a dangerous idea. Ellen sensed Logan panicking. He was on the verge of hysteria and didn't know what to do next. Logan, listen to me, Ellen interrupted him, her eyes filled with determination. I know what we need to do. You need to leave. You had offers for work abroad, right? You need to take that opportunity. Logan froze and looked at her, trying to gather his thoughts. And what will you do? Ellen sighed, stood up, and walked to the window. I'll return everything, go back to Brian. I convinced him it was just, a foolish prank, and he forgave me. Brian doesn't want this matter to become public either. He stands to lose a lot if people find out. Logan struggled to process the information. Are you sure you can handle Brian? This seems too risky. I have to do this, Ellen insisted. It's the only way to protect both of us and avoid Brian's revenge. I won't let anything threaten you because of me. Apparently, life with Brian is my destiny. Logan looked at Ellen, seeing desperate resolve in her eyes. All right, Logan agreed slowly. I'll leave. But as soon as you realize something's wrong, you call me immediately. Promise? I promise, Ellen nodded. Logan stood up, took out a bottle of red wine from the fridge and two elegant glasses from the cupboard. And now I want us to forget about all this for a few hours, and let tonight be the most beautiful and unforgettable night of our lives. Ellen watched as the beautiful red liquid slowly filled the expensive glasses. She felt a pang of guilt in her heart for deceiving Logan, a kind and sweet guy who loved her and wished her only the best. May everything work out well for you in life, Ellen looked sadly at Logan, and a glistening tear fell onto her hand. I'll always remember your love and support without which I couldn't have survived. Ellen approached Logan, hugged him tightly, and their lips met in a passionate kiss. The next morning, Logan called his workplace and confirmed the details of his transfer abroad. Convinced that the new job was indeed lucrative and promising for his future, he began packing his things. Every movement was filled with the weight and bitterness of impending separation. Ellen, promise me that even if we never see each other again, you'll still love me. Ellen silently approached and kissed Logan. The touch of her lips was filled with silent sorrow for the lost future. An hour later, a taxi pulled up, and Logan, lingering on the doorstep, embraced Ellen tightly. She held on to him, and for a moment, they stood still, trying to capture this last warm touch. 
take care of yourself, Logan. And remember, I will always be grateful to you for everything, Ellen whispered to him, releasing him into the unknown, leaving his heart broken but full of hope that everything would eventually work out. After Logan's departure, Ellen slept well, meticulously cleaned the apartment, packed her belongings, and handed the keys to the concierge before heading to the airport. The vibrant lights of the beautiful big city had long beckoned her with new hopes and aspirations. It was there that Ellen decided to start a new life and begin her hunt for a millionaire, something she had always dreamed of. With the remaining money, her first step was to purchase a small cosmetic salon on the outskirts of the city. It was not just a new venture but a step towards creating her own secluded world where every detail was under her control. Initially, she worked there herself, even living in a corner of the beauty salon that she had partitioned off for her own things. But one day, near the entrance of her salon, Ellen noticed a poorly dressed young woman asking for alms. Remembering herself from a few years ago, Ellen approached the beggar. The woman, noticing the salon owner, froze in fear. Excuse me, miss. If I'm bothering you or scaring away customers, I'll leave right away, the woman stammered nervously. Ellen thought for a moment and then asked decisively, what made you resort to begging? The woman lowered her eyes and timidly replied, I, my husband fell seriously ill and lost his job. I can't find work either. And we have a little child. At night, I clean floors in a supermarket, but that money barely covers my husband's medication. We decided he would take care of the child during the day, and I would beg. Maybe someone will help us. Please, don't report me to the police. I'll leave now, the woman added hastily. Ellen thought for a moment longer and then asked, What's your name? And do you know how to style women's hair? The woman unexpectedly brightened and said, My name is Lily, miss. I not only know how to style hair but also do manicures. I learned these skills once. If it weren't for my sudden marriage and child. Ellen instructed Lily to come into the salon, change into a uniform, and start working. For now, we'll have to do everything ourselves, take clients and clean up after them, Ellen introduced Lily to her salon. Lily, pleased with the timely job offer, gladly accepted all the conditions set by the salon owner. Although small, the beauty salon soon began to bring in a good income thanks to Ellen's efforts, her remarkable sense of beauty, and the massage skills she had learned from Mrs. Brown. Word quickly spread about the two friendly women who served clients politely, beautifully, and affordably, throughout the district. The earnings allowed Ellen to hire a couple of skilled workers for her salon, expand its space, and appoint Lily as the administrator. Meanwhile, Ellen sold a few pieces of jewelry left over from her life with Brian and bought a tiny but cozy apartment near the salon. Two small rooms and a kitchen suited Ellen perfectly. She decorated her new home in warm, muted tones, creating an oasis of calm and comfort where she could retreat from the outside world. Here reigned an atmosphere of tranquility and peace, making this apartment an ideal place to relax after a busy day at work. However, Ellen's main goal was far grander than simply running a business and decorating her home. Ellen began to pursue her dreams. She started by learning about all the wealthy residents of the city whose incomes were in the seven digits. She carefully studied the local elite, understanding that her future depended on connections and acquaintances. Among all the names that caught her attention was Ryan Darwin, a heir to a major company in digital technology. Ellen diligently gathered information about him without meeting him in person. She carefully studied his biography, got acquainted with one of Ryan's acquaintances, and learned that Ryan had recently lost his beloved mother. The woman was passionate about aviation sports and tragically died flying her private plane in fog. Ryan struggled deeply with the tragedy, gradually returning to life thanks only to his father and younger brother. Ryan rarely frequented nightclubs, which made it difficult for Ellen to approach him. However, she was accustomed to overcoming difficulties. First, Ellen found a photograph of Ryan's mother in her youth online and noticed a faint resemblance between them. The rest could be adjusted. Ellen underwent cosmetic surgery, subtly adjusting her nose and refining her lip line. Then she changed her hairstyle. She hoped that the distant resemblance to Ryan's mother would evoke an unconscious sense of closeness in him. And it must be noted, Ellen was not just beautiful now, she had become mysterious and alluring. 
After these manipulations, she began discreetly monitoring Ryan, waiting for the opportune moment to catch his eye. Studying his schedule and habits, she planned a meeting in such a way that he would perceive it as a coincidence. And that moment arrived. Ryan was always surrounded by various girls who tried by any means to capture his feelings first and then his money. Ryan saw through each of them and after a few minor encounters, he tried to end the relationships. That morning, he was having breakfast on the open terrace of an expensive restaurant with yet another girlfriend. She was lively and talkative, but his interest in her was waning. You know, yesterday I tried the most exquisite wine. She chattered on, completely unaware of his mood. Ryan nodded, barely listening to her. His bored gaze scanned the passers-by, and he was about to openly declare the breakup when the opportunity presented itself. A guy passing by their table suddenly smiled and waved to Ryan's girlfriend. She made a big mistake, she smiled back and waved in return. It was an innocuous gesture, but it was enough for Ryan to start an argument. You see, it's just… Ryan began. What is it? She turned to him with a smile. You pay more attention to others than to me, Ryan said seriously, using the moment as a reason to end the relationship. No, what are you talking about? I don't even know that guy. He just has such a sincere smile, the girlfriend tried to justify herself, but it was too late. Ryan suddenly seemed like a different person. You're interested in other guys now, not me. My smile doesn't please you anymore. What else about me don't you like? How I eat, sleep, or how I kiss you? Ryan's voice grew louder and louder. Restaurant patrons involuntarily turned to look at them. The girlfriend tried to stop Ryan, but he only became more heated. Unable to bear it, she grabbed her purse and, bewildered and offended, headed for the exit. Satisfied that he had rid himself of another fortune hunter, Ryan finished his coffee and headed to his car. The city bustled in its usual morning rush, people hurried about their business, sometimes not noticing cars pulling up to stores to pick up or unload goods. Ryan calmly crossed the street when a sudden honk made him turn around. Without looking, he stepped forward and accidentally knocked down a young woman who was nearby. Oh my god, I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. Ryan hurried to help her. It's okay, I wasn't paying attention myself, Elena said quietly, trying to get up, but she screamed in pain. Her hand was scratched against the asphalt, and blood was oozing from her scraped knee. Let me take you to the hospital, it's the least I can do, Ryan offered, visibly concerned. No, really, it's not necessary, I. Elena tried to refuse, but Ryan was determined. Supporting her by the elbow, he carefully helped Elena to his car. Once she was seated in the front passenger seat of his car, Ryan couldn't take his eyes off her. Her facial features, her gaze, there was something familiar and mesmerizing about them. You know, you remind me of someone. He said thoughtfully, trying to remember. Really? It's strange to hear that, Elena smiled, trying to hide her excitement. Upon arrival at the hospital, Ryan didn't leave Elena alone, he insisted on staying to make sure she was okay. The doctors examined Elena and quickly treated her wound. You're lucky, it's not serious, the doctor said as he bandaged her leg. You can go about your day without worry. Elena stepped into the corridor where Ryan anxiously awaited her. Thank you for your concern, Mr., Elena hesitated, indicating she didn't know his name. Darwin, Ryan Darwin, he introduced himself, helping her towards the exit. Elena Fox, she introduced herself, shaking her chestnut hair, which further puzzled Ryan. Ryan offered to drive Elena home, and after some hesitation, she accepted. A lively conversation quickly developed between them on the way. They started with discussing the weather and the hustle of modern life, then smoothly transitioned to more intimate topics. You know, I can't believe I randomly met such a famous person, Elena said, pretending not to know his status. Well, I'm not sure my fame makes your day any easier, Ryan chuckled. Actually, it makes my day a bit unusual, Elena admitted candidly. Usually at this time, I'm watching TV or tending to my indoor plants, those are my hobbies. Ryan looked at her with interest, setting aside his mobile phone. Do you live alone? What about your family? 
Elena froze momentarily, gathering her thoughts. She had carefully crafted this story about herself over the past few days. I'll tell you something no one else in this city knows. Elena glanced at Ryan, a mix of desire to share and fear of whether she was doing the right thing by opening up to someone she barely knew. Ryan understood and held the pause, allowing her to decide whether to continue the story. Elena gathered her thoughts. My parents, my brother, she began, her voice trembling. We lived in a small town by the sea. That day, I stayed home, I had a terrible headache. My parents took my brother with them to visit my mom's friend. By evening, a storm broke out. The friend urged them to stay, but my dad wanted to get back home. He didn't like staying overnight at someone else's place. The road wound through the mountains. My dad was a good driver and knew all the turns well. But something went wrong. Elena fell silent and sighed heavily. My family. They all died in a car accident a few months ago. I. I became an orphan. Tears welled up in Elena's eyes, and she continued quietly. After my parents' death, I had our home and a small business left, but there were too many debts. I had to sell the business and our family home to cover everything. Ryan gently took her hand. I'm so sorry, Elena. I know how hard that must be. I recently lost someone very close too. Thank you, Ryan, Elena wiped her tears and tried to smile. After settling my parents' debts, I couldn't live in the town that reminded me so much of my family. I packed up what was left and moved to this city. Now I live in a small apartment and am trying to rebuild my cosmetic salon to survive. You're remarkably brave and strong, Elena, Ryan said, his voice full of admiration. Most people would have just given up. When they arrived at Elena's home, she got out of the car and turned to Ryan. Thank you for driving me, and for listening to me. It's been so long since I've had such a heartfelt conversation with anyone. I don't have any friends or acquaintances in this city yet. No problem, Ryan handed her his business card. Here's my number. Don't hesitate to call if you need any help. Maybe I'll become your first friend in this city. He smiled warmly, and Elena noted to herself how pleasant his smile was. She nodded, accepting the card. Thank you, Ryan. It means a lot to me. They exchanged warm smiles, and Ryan watched as Elena slowly walked towards the entrance of her building. She didn't invite him in, which was unlike the behavior of many women he had met before. Ryan noted this trait and it further captured his attention. Ryan felt that Elena was very different from those girlfriends who, upon barely meeting him, immediately tried to drag him into bed hoping to secure him. When he left, Elena went up to her apartment, smiling in the darkness. The game had begun, and the first move had been made. Throughout the day and evening, Ryan went about his usual business but couldn't shake thoughts of Elena. He wanted to call her, but each time he held himself back, waiting to see how things would unfold. Two days had passed since Ryan last saw Elena. He tried not to rush things, giving himself time to assess whether Elena was just after his wealth like so many others. But as the third day came to an end without any news from her, Ryan decided to break the silence himself. Dialing the phone number Elena had left, he waited seconds until she answered. Hello, Elena, it's Ryan. How are you feeling? His voice was calm and relaxed. Oh, Ryan. Hi. I'm good, thank you. And how about you? Elena's joyful exclamation held a hint of restraint. I'm doing alright too. Listen, I'd like to see you again. Maybe we could have dinner tonight, he suggested. Elena hesitated for a moment before replying, that sounds tempting, Ryan, but, maybe we could just go for a walk? I'm not really in the mood for going to a restaurant. Ryan smiled into the phone. Elena's modesty was remarkable. A walk sounds perfect. Even better, where would it be convenient for you to meet? Maybe at the park by the river? It's close to my place, she proposed. Great, let's meet at the main entrance in two hours. Agreed, Ryan. See you then. Hanging up the phone, Ryan smiled. 
He liked that Elena preferred a simple walk over fancy dinners, which set her apart from many he knew. When they met, Ryan immediately noticed how neatly and elegantly Elena was dressed. Her outfit was perfectly suited for an outdoor stroll. It wasn't overtly seductive, yet it harmoniously emphasized her perfect figure and beautiful legs. They walked slowly through the park, enjoying the fresh evening air. Ryan, I have to admit, I feel a bit strange walking here with you, with you, Elena began, pausing to look out over the water. Why strange? His voice was filled with curiosity. Because. I'm not used to someone being so caring towards me. And I haven't really walked through this park, even though it's near my home. There just hasn't been time. Ryan also looked out over the water, where a light ripple ran from the fresh breeze. Elena, I admire you. And the more I get to know you, the more I like you. Ryan took her hands, and they continued their walk through the park, talking about a myriad of things, from favorite movies to deepest fears and dreams. It seemed that the trap Elena had so carefully set for Ryan was beginning to close, but not quite in the way she had originally planned. That evening, walking through the park with Ryan, for the first time in many years, Elena allowed herself to honestly dream of happiness. She was so tired of pretending and constantly making up stories to escape her past, which was now finally fading from her horizon. Next to Ryan, Elena felt completely safe. She was warm and comfortable in his embrace, and she hoped dearly that these feelings were mutual. She turned out to be right, after several days of such evening walks in old parks, boat rides, or drives, Ryan couldn't imagine himself without Elena anymore. Meanwhile, having thoroughly studied his preferences and habits, Elena deftly manipulated him, unknowingly becoming increasingly attached to him herself. Life taught Elena to be a good psychologist, to avoid conflicts, and to turn any situation to her advantage. But it was time to deepen their relationship. In conversation one day, Elena cautiously hinted to Ryan that she loved nighttime boat rides on the river. Ryan remembered this and one day invited Elena to go on a small boat ride, just the two of them. That evening, Elena wore a revealing dress and carefully styled her hair. When Ryan saw her, his heart raced, and an involuntary sigh escaped his chest, Elena looked truly magnificent. After a light meal and a couple of glasses of champagne, Ryan and Elena stepped out onto the deck. They stood by the railing, watching the slowly drifting lights of the sleeping city below. Ryan put his arm around Elena's waist, breathed in the scent of her hair, and felt as if he had disappeared from the real world. He turned Elena to face him, looked into her brown eyes, and kissed her passionately on the lips. She responded with equal fervor. Ryan swept her off her feet and they disappeared into the cabin. Waking up in Elena's embrace, Ryan felt like the happiest man on earth. He hadn't felt this good in a long time. His soul and heart soared and sang like they did in childhood when his mother used to swing him on the swings. From that day on, Ryan forgot about all the other girls in the world except Elena. He was already considering proposing to her when an event hastened his decision. One evening, Ryan and Elena were having dinner at a restaurant, sharing impressions of the day. The atmosphere in the restaurant was cozy and peaceful until an unexpected incident disrupted it. Soft music played in the dimly lit hall, waiters attended to the tables, and guests enjoyed the ambience and delicious food. No one noticed where the girl in black pants and a hoodie came from. She quickly approached Ryan and Elena's table. Before anyone could react, the girl stopped abruptly. You're fooling around with another girlfriend while well, you don't need me anymore, the uninvited guest hissed, breaking the peace. The girl in the black jacket tried to push Ryan and pulled out a knife. The blade glinted in the light of a small lamp on the table. Elena reacted instantly. She lunged forward, shielding Ryan. In that moment, Elena felt a sharp pain in her arm and, falling, hit her head hard on the table. The next second, security and waiters were already there. Are you okay? Ryan asked anxiously, picking up Elena in his arms while security escorted the girl in black away and waiters tried to stop the bleeding from Elena's wounded arm. I. I think I'm okay, Elena whispered, trying to hide the pain and losing consciousness. Ryan carried Elena and dashed through the entire restaurant hall to his car. Police officers and journalists were already at the entrance to the restaurant. 
Ryan, not letting anyone near him, shielded by security, got into the car and rushed to the nearest hospital. Elena received the necessary medical care but was left under observation by doctors in a ward. Sitting in the corridor, waiting for news, Ryan realized he could no longer postpone an important decision. As soon as you're feeling better, I want to show you a place you'll love, he said when Elena started to feel better. Where are we going? Elena asked, smiling through her weariness. To the ocean shore. Where you can hear the whispers of the waves and forget about everything else in the world. Several days later, when doctors allowed Elena to return to normal life, they set off on a journey. Ryan booked a beautiful room in a luxury hotel by the ocean, where every evening they could watch the sunset paint the sky in warm colors. It's wonderful, Ryan, Elena said, standing on the balcony and looking at the ocean. Let's take a walk along the shore. I love it when the ocean kisses my feet, Elena winked playfully at Ryan. They quickly gathered their things and made their way down to the water's edge. Elena, there's something I've wanted to tell you for a long time, Ryan began, embracing her around the waist. You've brought so much light into my life, more than I've seen in a long time. Ryan, I. Elena felt her voice tremble. Ryan took her hands in his and, kneeling before her on the warm sand amidst the sound of the waves and the gentle foam caressing their feet, softly asked. Elena, will you marry me? Tears of joy welled up in her eyes as she answered Ryan, almost choked with overwhelming feelings. Yes, Ryan, yes, I will be your wife. That night was magical. The stars shone brighter than ever, reflecting their happiness. Late at night, while Ryan slept, Elena got up and went out onto the balcony to gaze at the dark sky sprinkled with bright stars. She rejoiced. Her cherished dream had come true. Who would have thought that a girl from a poor family would one day stand on the balcony of one of the most expensive hotels on the coast, engaged to a wealthy groom? Anything is possible, she whispered to the night ocean, if you truly desire it. She turned and looked at Ryan, whom she loved as deeply as he loved her. The wedding was lavish and elegant, despite having very few guests. It was Elena who insisted on this wedding scenario, citing financial considerations. In reality, she feared that someone from her past life might recognize her and destroy everything she had worked so hard for. After the celebration and their honeymoon, Elena and Ryan settled into their spacious country house surrounded by green meadows and blooming gardens. Elena, now Ryan Darwin's wife, allowed herself to enjoy the life she had once only dreamed of. Ryan was pleased with his wife, and Elena was flying on wings of happiness. Despite having everything she had ever wanted, Elena did not sell her small apartment and beauty salon, which continued to bring her income. She decided to leave everything as it was for now. Learned from bitter life experience, Elena did not reveal her family secret to Ryan and did not tell him anything about her brothers and sisters. However, she did not forget her promise to help them if she managed to settle her own life. But first, she needed to find all her relatives scattered across different cities. Ryan, I really want to get involved in charity work, Elena said one day, looking at the golden stripes of the sunset. I've wanted to help people in need for so long. That's noble, Elena. I will always support you, Ryan smiled, embracing her. I know you have the abilities and strength to organize it all properly. Then I'll get started. Elena hugged her husband tightly and kissed him. I love you so much. And I love you, Ryan replied, drowning in the brown eyes of his beloved wife. Elena began searching for her brothers and sisters through charitable initiatives, allowing her to travel and discreetly investigate the fates of her family members. The first person she found was her older sister Sarah, who lived in the same town where Elena had once left with her aunt. Sarah had married, had two children, and lived a quiet, steady life like most people. Sarah did not recognize Elena, sisters hadn't seen each other in over 20 years, and Elena didn't dare to reveal herself to Sarah. Especially since Sarah considered their aunt to be her biological mother, who had never disclosed any family secrets to her. After careful consideration, Elena decided not to reveal her true identity. She came to the town disguised as a benefactor and organized a small charity event where she met Sarah's children, her nieces and nephews. Thanks to a small trick, Elena helped them win the main prize in the lottery she conducted herself. 
Thank you for your help and support, Sarah said excitedly, meeting Elena at the event. It's a joy to see smiles on children's faces, Elena warmly replied, feeling a slight pang in her heart from the necessity of hiding her true feelings and connection to Sarah. After that day, every Christmas, Sarah's family received a package with gifts that included everything from toys for the children to essential household items. And there was always a beautiful card in the box with a message to the active participants of the charity initiative. What a wonderful gift, Sarah exclaimed joyfully as she unpacked the package. It's so good to know there are people in the world who remember the importance of charity. Sarah sincerely thanked the person who sent her the gifts, but never discovered that it was her own sister, Elena. Elena watched all this from a distance, her heart filled with both sadness and joy simultaneously. She knew she would do everything possible to support Sarah's family, even though they hadn't been very close in childhood. This was her way of caring for her sister without disrupting the peace of her established life and without revealing the secret of their relationship. Next, Elena learned the fate of Michael, the youngest of all the children. Returning to her hometown, Elena first went to the house she had fled from over ten years ago. But that old damp house was long gone, replaced by a new solid structure with several nice apartments. It was there that Elena found the family of her neighbor who had adopted Michael. His life had turned out well. Michael also didn't know he was adopted. He grew up healthy, did well in school, and harbored serious aspirations of becoming a professional footballer, earnestly training at a sports academy. One autumn day, Elena visited the sports academy under the guise of a sponsor. Watching the training session, she was impressed by Michael's diligence and effort. Are you his mother? she asked the woman sitting next to her, pointing at Michael. Yes, he's my biological son, the neighbor proudly replied, unaware that the elegantly dressed woman was the same hungry little neighbor girl from years ago. He was so sickly in his childhood that we worried a lot about his future. But sports work wonders. Now Michael is not only a very good and healthy boy but also a promising young footballer. He's truly talented, Elena said respectfully, feeling a mix of pride and longing. She remembered rocking him to sleep in her arms, how he would cuddle up to her, feeling secure in Elena's protection. A vision flashed before her eyes, their mother, who had passed away, and a little tearful Michael in his creaky bed, reaching out to his sister. Elena turned away so that no one would notice the tears rolling down her cheeks. She quickly stood up and went outside. The chilly breeze with fine drops of autumn rain gently wiped away Elena's tears from her face, erasing the painting of memories like a disappointed artist. Elena composed herself and returned to the hall where the training was finishing. As a sponsor, I'd like to cover Michael's tuition at the sports academy, Elena addressed the neighbor whom Michael considered his mother. We should support talent that could ensure a bright future for Michael. That's very generous of you, the foster mother said in surprise. We're very grateful to you. Your help is much needed. We have a younger daughter growing up, and she'll need money for her education too. Elena noted down the neighbor's address and left. A few hours later, a delivery truck arrived at Michael's house. Two young men in overalls brought out and handed over to a stunned Michael standing at the threshold, new sports gear, shoes, and a couple of expensive footballs. Here's something for your sister too. All gifts from Mrs. Darwin. She wishes you success on the sports arena, one of the movers said, placing a large beautiful doll box beside the boy's feet. Michael was so overwhelmed by the unexpected gifts that he couldn't speak a word, he just nodded his head in gratitude. Elena watched this scene from her car parked nearby, smiling, knowing that she was doing something important for her brother, even if he would never learn the truth about his origins. After a successful meeting with Michael, Elena shifted her focus to finding Maggie and her two younger brothers. She found Maggie in a small town where the young woman lived in a dormitory and worked as a seamstress at the local factory. Maggie's life was challenging, barely making ends meet. One evening, as Maggie was leaving work, Elena approached her. Are you Maggie? Elena asked, handing her a business card from a beauty salon. Yes, that's me. How can I help you? Maggie cautiously replied, examining the card. I'm your distant relative on your mother's side. Upon learning about your difficult life, I would like to offer you a job. 
I need a talented person at my beauty salon, and perhaps you have the skills, Elena said softly, feeling her heart race at the thought of being close to her sister again. I. I don't know what to say. I'm just a seamstress, Maggie started uncertainly. Sometimes change is exactly what we need. Let's give it a try, Elena urged, hoping her sister would come to the city with her and be close by, as she had once hoped. After thinking it over for a few days and deciding she had nothing to lose, Maggie accepted Elena's offer. Subconsciously, Maggie felt drawn to Elena and a warm wave of unexplained love for this woman. As they drove to the city, Maggie pretended to sleep, leaning back in the seat next to Elena, but she carefully studied her distant relative. A vague suspicion crossed Maggie's mind when she noticed Elena's hair. Elena. My beloved Elena, Maggie sighed and closed her eyes tightly. How long I've waited for this meeting with you, how I've dreamt of rushing into your arms and holding you tight. But why won't you tell me the truth? Maggie opened her eyes and asked Elena to stop the car. I feel sick. Can I get out, she requested. Elena pulled over to the side of the road, and Maggie, opening the door, stepped out of the car. Elena followed her. Maggie walked a few steps away and turned to Elena. Her face was flushed, and her eyes were filled with determination and pain. I know who you are. You're Elena. You're my sister whom I haven't seen in so long. You're the one I prayed to God to meet every day. Yes, you've changed your appearance, you have expensive things and perfumes, but your heart still loves me and breaks with pain just like it did the day they separated us. Elena stood bewildered, unsure of what to say, while Maggie continued speaking. Why can't I hug you now, cling to you like I did in childhood, when you were our sister, mother, and protector from all our childhood woes? Maggie burst into tears, unable to contain such an emotional outpouring, and Elena, as if awakening, approached her and hugged her tightly. Forgive me, Maggie. I didn't know how you would react to meeting me. Will you agree to come to the city, and, no one must know that you're my biological sister? It has to be this way. I will do everything for you so that you lack nothing and live well. But we can't reveal the secret of our childhood. Maggie clung to Elena and took her hand, as she always did when they were children. Elena, I love you very much. I knew you were strong, you would rise from your knees, and you would never forget us. The girls got back into the car and drove to the city. On the way, Maggie told Elena everything she had endured, first in the children's home and then in the dormitory. Elena also shared a little about her own past and her current life as the wife of millionaire Mr. Darwin, explaining why they had to hide their relationship. You know, I found Sarah and Michael. They're doing well. I help them a bit, Elena modestly smiled, but then frowned. I haven't been able to find out anything about our younger brothers, Stephen and Tyler. They were taken away in a car by social workers, along with you. Maggie shook her head. We were distributed to different orphanages. A few months later, I was sent to a college for orphans. I tried to find my brothers, but I learned that their orphanage had burned down. Yes, Elena replied. That orphanage they ended up in suffered a fire, and many documents were destroyed. The only thing I managed to find out, talking to a former worker at the orphanage, was that two boys were adopted by a wealthy but childless family. Whether they were our brothers or not remained a mystery to me. But I haven't given up hope of finding out more about them and will continue my search. Maggie nodded understandingly and stared out the car window, mesmerized by the sights of the big city. They were almost there. Maggie was grateful to her sister for everything she had done for her and never ceased to admire her sister's perseverance, determination, and luck. Maggie rejoiced in Elena's happiness but did not envy her. The girl's heart was filled with such sincere love for her sister that there was simply no room in it for other feelings. Elena brought Maggie to her former small apartment and got her a job at her beauty salon. The girl's life gradually began to improve. If only Maggie knew the price she would have to pay for it. Two years of happy family life for the Darwin family flew by unnoticed. Both Elena and Ryan found in marriage what had been lacking in their lives and didn't think about more. One evening, they were having dinner at their favorite restaurant. The evening was warm and cozy as Elena and Ryan settled in at their usual table. 
Candles and antique holders softly illuminated their faces, and it seemed like their whole world right now was this table and the gentle warm glow of the candles. You've been so thoughtful lately, Ryan. Is everything okay? Elena asked softly, reaching out her hand across the table. Ryan held his gaze on her hand for a moment, then met his wife's eyes. I'm happy with you, Elena. You're everything I need. But you know. I really want children. Our cozy mansion is sorely lacking the patter of little feet in the rooms and the joyful laughter of children. I think I'd make a good father, and you, an excellent mother. Tenderness and love shone in Ryan's eyes. Elena felt her heart contract. She knew her diagnosis, which could shatter everything, and wanted to object to her husband, but looking into his eyes, she realized that it could raise unnecessary suspicion and concern for him. She couldn't risk her happiness. Children, that would be wonderful, she agreed with a faint smile. I've been wanting to suggest thinking about children for a long time, but you've been so busy with work lately. Ryan smiled and winked at Elena. I promise you, you'll never regret choosing me. I'll find time for our child. After dinner, Elena lay awake for a long time, staring into the darkness. She had long wanted to have a child herself, but how could she do it when doctors categorically stated that Elena would never have children again? She pondered. If they didn't have a child soon, their marriage could collapse. Initially, Elena visited almost all the clinics in their city, from expensive ones to little-known ones, hoping for a miracle. But the diagnosis remained the same, they could try, but the chances of carrying a child were slim. The consequences of the first abortion were showing. Pregnancy could be terminated at any moment. Was it worth the risk? After all, if something happened to the child, Ryan might start looking for the cause, and then Elena's secret would be revealed. How Ryan would react to this could only be guessed. Elena hadn't slept for several nights. Her brain feverishly searched for a way out of the situation. Finally, the thought of Maggie came to her. After all, they were very similar to each other, and Maggie was young and healthy. The next morning, Elena headed to Maggie's home. She found her sister in the park, feeding the birds. Today was Maggie's day off, and she was enjoying her solitude. Maggie, I need to talk to you about something very important, Elena began, sitting down next to her sister on the bench. Maggie looked at her in surprise. What's wrong, Elena? You look so serious and worried. Elena sighed, choosing her words carefully. I, my husband really wants children, but I can't have them. Doctors say it's impossible for me. But there's one way. Could you become a surrogate mother for our child? Maggie recoiled as if struck. That's a big responsibility, Elena. And it will change my life. Why don't you tell Ryan about your problems? Maybe he can figure out a solution himself. Elena shook her head. Once I told a guy the truth about my family, and he recoiled from me like I was a leper. I don't know how Ryan will react to the truth. Maybe he'll understand and forgive, or maybe. Elena faltered and looked at the birds hopping around the bench in search of breadcrumbs. Or maybe he'll kick me out, and I'll be left alone again with just my beauty salon and this little apartment. Wide-eyed, Maggie looked at Elena, who continued without noticing her gaze. I don't even know how we'll manage to live, how I'll continue to help Sarah and Michael. And will I be able to find our other two brothers? Now everything depends on your decision. Maggie remained silent, looking down and slowly scattering the remaining breadcrumbs. Then she nodded thoughtfully. I need to think, Elena. This is not an easy decision. I know it's a strange request, Elena continued, and I've turned to you only because no one else can help me. If you agree, I'll ensure you and your future. How can we do all this, Elena? There was anxious concern in Maggie's voice. What if Ryan finds out? Don't worry, little sister, I'll take care of that. Life has taught me a lot. I think it's worth the risk. Are you willing? Maggie looked at Elena and hugged her. I've always trusted you completely. If you say this is the only way, I'm ready. Elena embraced her younger sister and kissed her gently. 
She knew it was a very dangerous and risky scheme, but it was the only chance to save her marriage and give Ryan what he so desired. And at the same time, to keep her secret. Elena prepared for the next phase of her life. First, she found a very good, expensive clinic where everything could be done anonymously. Elena provided the necessary biological material and paid for all the necessary tests for Maggie. She carefully monitored every step of the operation, ensuring complete anonymity at the clinic. She covered all expenses related to the surrogacy program herself, not giving Ryan even the slightest hint of her maneuvers. When Maggie confirmed that she was pregnant, Elena was overcome with euphoria. She couldn't believe her plan was working so well. Excited and full of hope, she went home and waited for Ryan, burning with impatience. Darling, I have wonderful news for you, she began speaking as soon as Ryan walked in the door. Ryan, tired after a hard day full of meetings and appointments, perked up. What is it, my love? We're going to be parents soon. Elena beamed with happiness. We're having a baby. Ryan froze for a moment, then, with a joyful exclamation, swept his wife up in his arms and spun her around the room. Elena laughed, but soon asked him to gently put her down, complaining of dizziness. Sorry, darling, I just can't contain my excitement. You make me the happiest person on earth, Ryan kissed her tenderly, and she responded with a smile, hiding the pain and bitterness of deceit behind it. Days passed, and Elena began to exhibit typical pregnancy symptoms, morning sickness, fatigue, and frequent headaches. She acted out morning sickness so convincingly that Ryan never doubted her condition for a moment, understanding it as part of the natural process. But inside, Elena's anxiety grew. What should she do next? How could she keep her secret hidden from Ryan's prying eyes, especially as her figure was soon expected to change? Time was slowly but surely gaining momentum, and Elena realized that soon she would have to take action. What action, Elena didn't yet know, so she decided to consult her sister. As soon as Ryan left for work, she picked up the phone and dialed Maggie's number. Maggie, we need to meet. I want to know how things are going with you and what the doctors are saying, she whispered into the receiver. All right, Elena. I'll be waiting for you, Maggie replied, realizing the dangerous game they had embarked upon, where any wrong move could lead to total failure and disgrace. Elena knew this too. With each passing day, she understood more and more that the stakes were too high, and any mistake could cost her everything she had achieved. Her nerves were stretched like strings, and every move, especially when Ryan was at home, was rehearsed and played out in advance. Elena lived as if on a powder keg, afraid of any noise. So when her phone rang on the nightstand early in the morning, she startled and sat up in bed. The first rays of sunlight barely touched the curtains of the bedroom, Ryan slept peacefully, wrapped in a blanket. Elena grabbed the phone and glanced at the display. Maggie's name flashed on the screen. Elena's heart pounded with a sense of foreboding. She quietly stepped out into the hallway and picked up the receiver. Elena, I need to talk to you urgently, Maggie's voice sounded anxious. What happened? Are you okay? Elena was starting to get nervous. I, just come over, please. I need to show you something. Elena entered the bedroom and began to dress quietly. Where are you going so early? Ryan, sleepy-eyed, looked at Elena with concern. Is something wrong? Elena forced a strained smile and quickly found an answer. Go back to sleep, didn't want to wake you. I forgot to tell you yesterday that I have a scheduled checkup at the clinic today. I arranged to come earlier to avoid the traffic jams, I find them so irritating. Ryan also hated traffic jams, especially when he was in a hurry, so he wasn't surprised by Elena's choice. Be careful on the road and take your time, he wished his wife, yawning sweetly. Call me if anything comes up. Elena kissed her husband, who decided to sleep a little longer, and herself drove to her sister's. Arriving at Maggie's, Elena found her sitting on the bed with some papers in her hands. Maggie's entire demeanor reflected the seriousness of the situation. I found out about this yesterday, but it was too late to call you. I could barely wait until morning. What is this? Elena asked softly, taking the papers from Maggie's hands. Medical tests? 
ultrasound? See for yourself, Maggie replied quietly, her eyes filled with tears. Elena looked at the ultrasound results. Two little lives beating under her sister's heart were displayed on the image. They were twins. Maggie, this, this is wonderful, Elena tried to hide her surprise and excitement. I can imagine how happy Ryan will be with two babies. No, Elena, it's not just wonderful. It changes everything, Maggie swallowed tears with difficulty. I can't give up both babies. I've already grown to love them. I couldn't imagine how I would part with my child. I want to keep one for myself. It will be easier. Elena silently stared at her sister. She understood her feelings, but how could they split the babies? Yet, on the other hand, this was wonderful. Both Elena and Maggie would have a child. The sisters would continue to communicate, and whatever happened next, happened. I understand you, Maggie. Let it be so. Ryan will be happy with one child, Elena said gently. Really? Are you sure? Maggie looked at Elena hopefully. Yes, I'll figure everything out, Elena encouraged her sister, although she herself didn't yet understand how to do it. By the rules, the doctor was supposed to hand over both babies from the surrogate mother. But Elena knew that money could change any rule. Kissing Maggie and forbidding her to worry about anything, Elena turned her attention to a more global task. She needed to figure out how to simulate a growing belly while constantly being around Ryan. Elena pondered the possibility of a false hospitalization under the pretext of pregnancy preservation, followed by a fake quarantine. This would allow her to conceal the absence of a belly and avoid Ryan's visits to the hospital room. Meanwhile, she could show pictures of her sister's belly. Maggie, listen, I've been thinking. Maybe I should ask the doctor to admit me to the hospital for pregnancy preservation? That way, it'll be harder for Ryan to suspect anything, Elena suggested. That seems risky, Elena. What if he wants to visit? Maggie worried. I'll talk to the doctor. I'll arrange for him to recommend as few visits as possible. Then he can declare quarantine for me altogether. You'll be with me, supporting me, right? Elena assured. It'll all work out, Maggie. We'll get through this together, Elena whispered, hugging her sister, sensing they were entering the final and most dangerous round of their game. As they discussed the plan, fate once again intervened. Elena sometimes felt like she was born under a lucky star, always managing to pull a lucky ticket out of life's difficulties. Because whenever Elena found herself at a dead end, fate immediately reached out a hand and opened new doors. It happened this time too. Elena met Ryan at the doorstep of their home. He stood in the hallway, nervously twiddling the car keys. Ryan, what's wrong? You look like something's chasing you, Elena said worriedly, entering the room. Elena, I have news, and I'm afraid you won't like it. I need to leave, Ryan began slowly, clearly trying to choose his words. Leave? But what about me? What about, our baby? Elena took a step back, her voice trembling, feigning fear. It's a new contract, Elena. Very important for our future. But it requires me to be overseas. It might take a few months, Ryan sighed heavily, approaching and embracing Elena by the shoulders. But how will I manage alone? Elena pressed against him, feigning tears, although her soul was singing and rejoicing. I know it's tough, but you're strong. You can do it, I believe in you. And I promise to call you every day, Ryan kissed her forehead, trying to reassure her. I. I understand, it's important for us. You have to go, Ryan. I'll take care of everything here. Don't worry, Elena found the strength to smile, pushing Ryan towards the decision that was so advantageous for her plans. The next day, Ryan flew away, leaving Elena alone. She immediately went to a specialized store and bought belly pads, simulating various stages of pregnancy. Now she could calmly talk to her husband via video calls, without raising unnecessary questions and suspicions. Every time she spoke to Ryan, Elena positioned the camera so that he could see her full height but couldn't detect the fake belly. Hi, sweetheart. 
Look how I've grown, she joyfully exclaimed, smoothly turning in front of the camera. Oh, my dear, how I miss you. You look beautiful, Ryan was charmed, his voice trembling with excitement. Sometimes I feel our baby kicking, Elena continued cheerfully. It's incredible. I wish I could be there. Are you sure you're comfortable alone? Maybe I should come back? Ryan was already considering returning. No, my love, it's not necessary. Everything's fine here with me. Focus on your work. We're waiting for you here, Elena skillfully redirected the conversation to reassure him. This game continued for the last few months, and Elena became more and more immersed in her role. Every call from Ryan was a carefully staged scene, every morning began with planning the next a performance. But how long could she continue this game? And would Ryan return earlier than expected? For such a scenario, Elena still spoke with the doctor and arranged for an urgent hospitalization, for pregnancy preservation and quarantine. But everything went perfectly. Maggie gave birth to twin girls on time, who looked like two peas in a pod. Only one had two birthmarks on her leg, while the other girl's legs were clear. They were given similar names, Lara and Lana. Elena was present at the birth, and she was immediately placed with Lana in a separate room. Maggie and her daughter Lara were moved to another building to avoid any confusion. Elena stood by the hospital room window when she heard a loud male voice. Rushing to the window, she saw Ryan below, smiling and waving at her. On the green grass, a floral arrangement read, Elena, thank you for our daughter. Ryan. How? How did you get here, she shouted, opening the window wider. I couldn't wait another minute. I had to see you and our daughter, his voice filled with delight. Elena couldn't hold back tears of joy, watching her husband happily jumping below. At that moment, she felt the weight of deceit heavy on her heart, but Ryan's happiness outweighed all doubts. A few days later, Elena and Lana returned home. Ryan carried them both in his arms, attending to his daughter at night, strolling with Lana in her stroller. Elena was floating in clouds of happiness and love, but sometimes a shadow of doubt crept into her heart that things were going too well to last. She began to fear that this fairy tale might one day come to an end. Upon Maggie's discharge from the hospital, Elena bought her a nice apartment in another city, almost in the city center, and transferred her business to her, now with two beauty salons. Maggie gradually settled into the new apartment and adjusted to her role as a mother. Elena did everything possible to ensure a comfortable life for her and Lara. Absorbed in caring for their daughters, the sisters saw each other rarely and tried not to remind each other of the complex and convoluted game they miraculously won. Maggie, are you sure you don't want any help? Elena would constantly ask during their rare meetings. No, Elena, you've already done too much for me. Lara is my joy, and I'm managing, Maggie smiled, affectionately glancing at Lara. Three years passed unnoticed. Ryan and Elena were happy raising Lana, while Maggie joyfully watched Lara grow. However, the calm was deceptive, and Elena felt it. Apparently, she had exhausted her luck, allotted by fate. Because recently, troubles seemed to follow Elena. First, Lana fell seriously ill. Elena spent several days in the hospital by her daughter's bedside, never taking her eyes off her. Meanwhile, Ryan, darkened with his helplessness to do something for their daughter, searched the city for the best doctors. When Lana finally recovered, exhausted from worry, Ryan ended up in the hospital with a hypertensive crisis. Elena was torn between two hospitals. She wanted to be with Ryan and feared leaving her daughter for too long. Finally, Ryan and Lana were discharged home, and the family breathed a sigh of relief. However, life decided to exact a toll from Elena for her luck and deceit. That day, Elena lingered at a charity event. In the hustle of the activities, she barely noticed the faces around her, but at one point, she raised her head to present another gift and locked eyes with someone in a dark coat. Fear and horror pierced her soul like a sharp rapier. Elena recognized the person she hoped never to see again. It was Logan. He gave her a slight nod, covering his eyes, and vanished into the crowd. Elena barely found the strength to continue the ceremony, but now she scrutinized all the guests of the evening attentively. 
When it was all over and everyone had dispersed, Elena hurried to her car. She was certain that Logan would be waiting for her there. But to her surprise, there was no one in the parking lot. Just rows of cars lined up neatly, and security standing at the entrance. Elena glanced around anxiously, no one. Silence, and gusts of wind signaling an approaching storm. She got into her car and quickly drove out of the parking lot, heading home. Exhaustion weighed heavily on Elena, pressing her into the seat like a heavy blanket. All she dreamed of right now was being home, close to her beloved daughter, taking a bath, and then falling asleep in Ryan's strong embrace. Logan's unexpected appearance had frightened her, and Elena was lost in her thoughts. Why is he here? What brought him, and how did he find her? Why didn't he stay to talk to her? Or maybe it's not Logan, but someone who looks very much like him? Elena speculated, her thoughts swirling in her head, distracting her from the road. The car slid along the dark, nearly deserted streets. Elena pressed on the gas pedal harder than necessary, struggling to keep her eyes open. There was just under a kilometer left to the intersection leading to her home when an old truck unexpectedly emerged from the turn. Its headlights blinded Elena. She instinctively hit the brakes. The car skidded, lightly grazing the truck, before flipping over and sliding into a ditch. Meanwhile, Ryan had already put Lana to bed and was sitting in the kitchen, checking the latest news and waiting for Elena. The ringing of her phone shattered the peaceful silence, causing Ryan to startle. A foreboding of trouble hung in the air. Mr. Darwin? Your wife Elena has been in an accident and is now in the hospital in critical condition. The caller continued speaking, but Ryan didn't hear him anymore, his happy world had crumbled, shattered into pieces. He called a nanny for Lana and rushed to the hospital, in complete bewilderment and fear. Where is she? Please, I have to see her, he pleaded anxiously with the hospital staff. Seeing his state, the doctors didn't object. Ryan entered the room where Elena lay motionless, connected to numerous machines. Ryan sat down beside the bed, taking Elena's hand in his. He sat there for hours, trying to detect any sign of life, but all he heard was the steady beeping of the machines. Eventually, emotionally and physically exhausted, he drifted off into a light sleep. In his semi-conscious state, he heard a faint whisper. Elena moved her lips. Ryan leaned in closer to her face. Forgive me for everything, she whispered barely audibly. I just wanted to be happy. Take care of Lara, she, she's your daughter. I love you so much. Elena's words were barely audible, but each one struck Ryan's heart like a hammer. No, don't say that, you will live. We will be together. Everything will be okay, Ryan whispered softly, trying to hold back his tears. But Elena sighed and went still. Doctors rushed into the room, bustling around Elena's bed, changing tubes, doing something, and quickly ushered Ryan out into the corridor, firmly closing the door behind him. He stood by the room, unable to comprehend anything, trying to make sense of Elena's final words, oblivious to everything around him. After what felt like hours to Ryan, though it was only minutes, a doctor emerged from the room and approached him. I'm sorry for your loss, but we did everything we could, the doctor said in a quiet, sorrowful voice. Her injuries were very severe. Ryan felt like his heart had stopped. He silently nodded, unable to utter a word, not understanding how to go on living without his beloved Elena. Struggling to hold back tears, he drove home where little Lana awaited him. Upon returning home, Ryan went to his daughter's room. The girl was peacefully asleep, her chestnut hair, just like Elena's, spread across the pillow. He approached the crib slowly, gently touching her little hand. I promise I will protect you like the most precious treasure in my life, he whispered softly, feeling heavy tears streaming down his cheeks. After Elena's funeral, Ryan struggled for a long time to come to terms with it. There was emptiness around him, and the meaning of life seemed lost. Every evening, after putting Lana to bed, Ryan would sit alone in the kitchen, reminiscing about Elena, her smile, the mischievous spark in her eyes. It felt like any moment the door would open and Elena would burst into the kitchen with her unstoppable energy, scolding Ryan for not yet changing out of his office suit. And so it was on this evening. Ryan sat at the table, a glass of whiskey in front of him. 
The oppressive silence was undisturbed. Ryan stood up and opened the window. Cold air rushed into the room, but he didn't notice, lost in his thoughts of the past, of Elena. A knock at the door shattered the silence. Ryan jerked upright and, looking displeased at the clock, walked over and opened it. Standing at the threshold was a person in a dark cloak, their face concealed by a hood. I'm sorry, I'm looking for Elena. I need to talk to her urgently, the stranger's voice was low and heavy. Ryan froze, searching for words. Elena. Elena is no longer here. And never will be. She, she passed away, he managed to say. The stranger didn't move. He just lifted the hood slightly and cast a sharp, piercing glance at Ryan. Are you sure about that? Are you absolutely certain that Elena is gone? The stranger asked. Ryan was speechless. The stranger's words confused and frightened him, and he stood there, not knowing how to respond. Then there was the sound of little bare feet slapping against the floor in the room. Ryan turned around. Before him stood a sleepy Lana, staring at the stranger with wide eyes. Daddy, who is this? Did he bring a letter from mommy? Lana asked innocently. The stranger flinched and, turning his back, slowly walked away. Who are you? What do you want? Ryan called after him, picking Lana up in his arms. The stranger stopped, paused for a few seconds, then turned to Ryan. Elena would never leave her daughter. So if she's truly gone, then she is, the stranger said quietly. I mourn with you. Who the hell are you? Ryan couldn't calm down, struck by what was happening. The past. A past that no longer matters to anyone, echoed the stranger without turning his head, and disappeared into the darkness. Ryan stood by the door, holding Lana close, understanding nothing. Suddenly Lana's hand tightly hugged his neck. Ryan jerked and looked at his daughter. Hope and sadness were visible in her eyes. Daddy, let's go to sleep, she softly said. I feel so bad alone. And together we will wait for mommy to come back soon, right? His daughter's words pierced Ryan's heart like a knife. He hugged her, words stuck in his throat. Ryan nodded, unable to bring himself to tell her that mommy would never come back again, afraid to shatter her childish hopes. Yes, sweetheart, let's go to sleep, he said, kissing Lana on the cheek and heading towards her room. The appearance of the stranger had shattered Ryan's peaceful life. The thought kept spinning in his head, Elena's past. What past could connect his wife with this unpleasant person? Why didn't he believe that Elena was no more? Did his beloved wife have some kind of secret? Ryan had been asking himself these questions repeatedly and couldn't find answers to them. Then suddenly he remembered Elena's last words again. He went over them in his mind, trying to understand why she called Lana by another name. Back then, in the hospital room beside Elena's dying bed, he had thought he must have misheard. Now, however, doubts were creeping into his soul. But nothing more happened. Ryan, after speaking with many people, reassured himself that Elena had been faithful to him and had never given him any reason to doubt her honesty. Whatever might have existed before Ryan, he was no longer interested in it. He didn't want to tarnish the bright name of his beloved wife. And Ryan decided to forget about the stranger. The year dragged on slowly and monotonously. Ryan immersed himself in work and caring for his daughter. He enrolled Lana in a prestigious daycare near the city center, and every evening, picking her up himself, he tried to fill their time together with laughter and games. One evening, as Ryan approached the daycare, he saw Lana playing in the sandbox. The daycare teacher stood aside, talking on the phone. Lana, come here, sweetheart, he called out to her. Lana dropped her shovel and ran to him, her eyes shining with joy. Daddy. Today we learned a new song, and I want to sing it for you at home, she exclaimed excitedly. Excellent, darling, Ryan smiled. Let's go, you'll show me everything you learned today. Lana waved to the daycare teachers and took Ryan's hand. As they walked to the car, Ryan sighed, feeling the weight of his loneliness lighten a bit when he heard his daughter's voice. He knew there were many challenges ahead, but he had a little girl by his side who filled his life with warmth and light. 
Time slowly healed the wound, Elena's image no longer shone as brightly, and Ryan's heart began to thaw a little. Young women and girls began to appear around the wealthy widower again, dreaming of replacing Elena. But Ryan couldn't imagine any of them becoming not only a good wife, but also a mother to Lana. So he kept everyone at arm's length. Several more years passed unnoticed. This year, Lana was supposed to start school, and Ryan was looking for a good educational institution for her. One day, Ryan had to leave for a few days. To keep Lana from feeling lonely while he was away, he decided to give her a gift. He enrolled her in the best summer camp where she immediately made friends. Every evening they talked on the phone, and Ryan was happy to hear Lana's cheerful voice, recounting all the day's events. But now the camp session was coming to an end. Early in the morning, driving to pick up Lana, Ryan was almost at the camp when his deputy called. Mr. Darwin, we have urgent deliveries, but the papers haven't arrived yet. Ryan started sorting out the situation, making calls to one representative of the firm and then another. His phone was buzzing in his hands. Thus engaged, he headed home, where Lana awaited him. He immediately noticed his daughter in a sky-blue dress, and lifting her up, quickly headed to the car. The security guard, following close behind them, picked up Lana's suitcases. Lana started to struggle and hiss, but Ryan, engrossed in his conversation, didn't pay much attention. Not now, Lana, I have work issues. Let's play at home, he said, settling Lana into the car and closing the door. Throughout the drive, Ryan continued talking on the phone. It wasn't until they entered the city that he finally put the phone aside. All right, the problem is solved. How about I buy your favorite donuts? Ryan glanced at Lana in the rearview mirror and winked at her. But she suddenly frowned. Mom doesn't let me eat sweets. Especially before dinner, his daughter's words shook Ryan. Lana, this isn't funny. And don't be mad at me. I really have a lot of work today. But Lana remained silent, staring out the window. Today she seemed somehow different, not like herself. Had she not slept well? Is everything all right, my girl? Ryan asked, but immediately stopped himself upon catching Lana's surprised glance. Then Ryan's phone rang again. Glancing at the unfamiliar number calling him, Ryan pondered for a few seconds before picking up the receiver. Hello, he heard a voice that seemed familiar to him. Ryan wanted to reply, but then the phone went silent. Ryan glanced at it and, annoyed, tossed it onto the adjacent seat, the phone had run out of battery. Deciding to charge it at home, where they had already arrived, Ryan slipped the phone into his pocket and got out of the car. But Lana's behavior at home scared Ryan so much that he completely forgot about the phone. Upon entering the house, the girl didn't run to her playroom to hug all her toys, instead, she began inspecting the mansion's rooms carefully. Ryan decided to embrace his daughter. Lana, what happened at the summer camp? Everything was fine just yesterday. Did someone hurt you? Ryan's voice was gentle and tender, but the girl suddenly recoiled from him as if from a stranger. Ryan thought Lana was trying to get back at him for being preoccupied throughout the journey. All right, go ahead and sulk for a bit if that's what you want, but change your clothes in the meantime. Ryan took out Lana's favorite home shorts and t-shirt from the closet. Lana took the clothes and stared at them in surprise. Do I have to wear this? Ryan started to get irritated. Stop fooling around. You're not good at it. Lana went to another room and emerged a minute later wearing the t-shirt and shorts. Ryan smiled satisfactorily. It's about time. Now let's go to the kitchen. Your favorite fruit drink is waiting for you there. Lana froze at the doorway. How do you know I really love fruit drinks? Ryan decided not to pay attention to his daughter's whims, thinking it was some new game she was playing. Ryan placed a glass of fruit drink in front of his daughter and went for her favorite cookies. Then his gaze unexpectedly fell on Lana's legs poking out from under the shorts. In the next second, the bowl of cookies slipped from Ryan's hands and smashed, scattering cookies and wafers across the kitchen. Where? Where are your birthmarks? Ryan's breath caught in his throat. He grabbed Lana, sat her down on a chair, and carefully examined the girl's leg again. 
What birthmarks? I've never had any, Lana calmly got off the chair, and actually, I'm not Lana, I'm Lara. And I really want to go home to mom. The girl sat down in a corner and burst into tears. Confused, Ryan decided it was some cruel prank or that he was losing his mind. Unsure of what to do, he took Lana to her playroom and called his brother. His brother listened attentively and asked him again. You're claiming that when you picked up your daughter from summer camp, you noticed some birthmarks were missing and her character had changed. But that can't be. The conversation was interrupted by loud crying from the playroom. Entering the room, Ryan saw Lana sitting on the bed, crying. He wanted to comfort her, but she recoiled from him and cried even harder. Ryan stood perplexed by the girl, listening to her barely audible words through her sobs. I'm not Lana, I'm not Lana at all. I'm Lara. And Lana is my sister. And you're not my dad, and this isn't my home. Ryan was about to call for doctors, suddenly thinking his daughter might have been poisoned, when the security guard called, saying that a woman wanted to see Mr. Ryan and that Lana was with her. Stunned by this turn of events, Ryan instructed to let the woman in and, picking up Lara, went downstairs. In the semi-darkness of the living room, barely making out the young woman, Ryan decided something otherworldly was happening to him today. Before him stood Elena, though dressed in some strange outfit she'd never wear before, holding a girl's hand. Lana broke free from the woman and ran to Ryan, staring in surprise at the girl he held in his arms. Ryan put Lara down, and she quickly hid behind the woman. I'm sorry, the woman struggled for words. There was a mistake at the summer camp today. I was late picking up Lara because of work, and the nanny accidentally took your daughter instead. Ryan suddenly heard familiar tones of Elena's voice in this woman's voice. Unsure what to think, he flicked the switch. A large chandelier lit up under the living room ceiling, flooding the room with bright light. Ryan scrutinized the stranger and confirmed that she wasn't Elena. She just bore a strong resemblance to her. The woman looked down and apologized again, preparing to leave. Ryan stopped her. He remembered Elena's final words. So he hadn't misheard, she had said, Lara is also your daughter. He instructed the woman to come upstairs and tell him everything about herself and her daughter. The woman was frightened but didn't refuse. After putting both girls to bed, Ryan made coffee and prepared to listen. My name is Maggie, I'm Elena's sister, the woman began, and I'm not sure if I should reveal someone else's secret. She's not mine, she's Elena's. And she suffered so much from having to deceive you. Ryan, taking a sip of hot coffee, looked at Maggie. Elena is gone now anyway. But I want to know the whole truth about my late wife. Don't be afraid, no one will know this secret beyond these walls. Maggie thought for a moment and, gathering courage, told Ryan about how she became the mother of these two girls, where Elena's sister came from, and everything Elena had once told Maggie about her life. They talked through the night. Then Maggie suddenly looked up at Ryan with tearful eyes and asked softly. Now that you know almost everything about me and Elena, can you decide the fate of my, our daughters? But, you won't kick me out of the apartment and take away the business, will you? And most importantly, you won't deprive me of my daughter? Ryan sat there devastated. He couldn't believe that the woman he loved so much and trusted so implicitly had deceived him like this. He didn't know what to do now. Why, why didn't she tell me anything? We could have figured something out together. Maggie, silently watching him, suddenly touched his hand. Don't judge Elena. She loved you deeply and was willing to do anything for that love. Do you think it was easy for her to agree to this? You have no idea how much she agonized over having to deceive you. But you wanted children so badly, Ryan, and due to her health, she couldn't have them. Maggie stood up. Thank you for the coffee. I have to go. Can I take Lara with me? But she's sleeping, Ryan replied, it's almost morning. Stay here with us. You can sleep next to your, daughter. In the morning, Maggie took Lara and went home. Ryan took a long time to come to terms with everything, but eventually, he decided to do a DNA test and confirmed that Maggie had told the truth. In the evening, after putting Lana in the car, he drove to Maggie's with Lara. 
The woman was happy to see them. Come in, Ryan. You won't believe it, but Lara was really looking forward to seeing you and Lana. The girls became very close at the summer camp and now they don't want to be apart. Ryan smiled. Maggie, I have a proposal for you. Maggie tensed, worry flickering in her eyes. But Ryan immediately reassured her. I propose that you and Lara move into my house. I want my daughter to get used to me and my mansion. I promise I won't take Lara away from you, just stay with me for now. We'll figure something out from there. After some reflection, Maggie agreed and soon moved into Ryan's home. At first, Ryan was cautious about Maggie's presence, and she herself was shy about her position. But soon they got used to each other and spent more and more evenings together, taking walks in the park with the girls or just talking in the living room. On the next anniversary of Elena's death, Maggie and Ryan bought flowers and came to the cemetery. They stood by the grave, holding both girls' hands. Suddenly, Lara sighed quietly and asked. Is she also my mom? Do I have two moms? And I have two moms, Lana echoed. When one flies up to the sky, the other one comes. And you know, Maggie, Lana turned to her, I really loved my mommy Elena. But I love you too. And daddy loves all of us. Lana looked at Ryan. He glanced shyly at Maggie standing next to him. She blushed and looked down. Ryan didn't say anything yet, but somehow he was already sure that little Lana had said what he had been afraid to say for so long, and that now he wouldn't let Maggie or his second daughter Lara go anywhere.